Onigashimasu. Welcome back to the Gojuri Karate Center. A couple of people have been asking me about Super Rinpe, and when I did my first videos, my follow along kata videos, I suggested that Super Rinpe is something very, very important, very, very sacrosanct, and by and large, I don't want to do too much with it because the big senseis, the high grade senseis, often this is their domain. So, what I'm going to do today is touch on some ideas. I don't want to call it the bunkai or beginner to advanced bunkai. Just some ideas from Super Rumpe to work with, to work around, to help somebody build and develop their kata. And the ideas extensively come from the cutters below. Super Rumpe seems to be the collecting point of a lot of principles from a lot of Gorjuru cutters. Not all the cutter, but a lot of the cutter. And it allows you to have something. Our biggest commentator, who one of our biggest commentators, constantly posts the most uh, hilarious posts uh, and always is commenting on poor Brian being beaten. Leave some fantastic ideas on which cutters are used for what purpose. And it's it's in a comment, I'm sure, since Zoe will go and find it and present it somewhere or present it somewhere. It's quite a long comment. And the comment basically goes, certain kata were very much mastery cutters, demonstration cutters, demonstration cutters for individual ruha or schools, and some cutters are extensively goju, some cutters are extensively nahate, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of important to understand that Super Rinpe is very long, and the reason of, for most of its length is the massive repetition. But the other thing is, it is a collection of our ideas, showing them off within the cutter, and having a longer time frame to train. And again, this helps with stamina and building endurance, etc. Obviously, competition, the more time you spend on the floor, the more likely you're going to have a better judgment in favor of you if your cutter is better because it might be more fresh in a judge's memory and therefore you might get a better score or a better, a better chance of winning on the flags. That, that aside, um, the ideas of the cutter are important and they're essentially taken as a collective from everywhere else. So, this movement is done three times. It's the same movement from Sanchen, Tensho, Sansaru, Seisan, and obviously Superumpi. And the only other variant thereof that we tend to do that is quite easy to see is Sisortion, where the hands are open. So, I think let's work on a, a simple bunkai or simple idea with a partner. All right, unscripted. Brian doesn't know what's about to happen. Okay, so Brian, right, light, right side back. Okay, so I worked on the idea in my head this morning that if Brian punches Chudan, I'm going to move inside, block hit, and straight away outside, block hit. Brian is then going to pivot and punch towards me, and there is a third option. So the idea of giving you three ideas. First idea is right side back, moving, punch two done, to the inside, and hitting. Second idea, shifting and blocking, or moving to the outside. Third idea, as he does a second punch or attack, move, hit, or hit. So this is idea number one. And it covers the first three movements, and I've shown three variations of the idea. You can practice them as individuals, or coupling them together, that's up to you. The idea is just simple ideas. Hey, thanks Brian. We get to that, the hands come in, and rotate out. Some schools fully, some schools sideways. All right, so, there are a couple of ways we can break this down. It can be maybe similar to Kurumfa, where the hands go out, because both hands are going out. 
It can be similar to some school's way of ending seyunshin, where the hands go out first, then up, and then down. So you need to understand where your school is, what kind of framework they follow, and then you can maybe pull from one of those ideas. Or uh, our school tends to not rotate the hands fully, it tends to have the hands turned at an angle, and our hands are not perfectly to the side, not perfectly to the side, slightly forward. Okay? And some of the best ideas for this are very simple. Hey, Brian, let's go. Brian is punching one. Let's go with that hand, please. One, two, three. Three. Pushing, pulling. Simplest idea. All right. And if we go around, we start getting to this. Okay, so let's go from the other side this time, please. So one, two, could be hitting, fingers grabbing behind the jaw, in the eyes, grabbing the hair, attacking the neck, attacking the neck. All right? Or if you maybe want to under the arm and press. Let's do that one from the other side, please, Brian. Hey, again. So from under the arm and press. The reason I don't like doing this one, it's very awkward, he has a lot of strength here. You actually have to crank his arm to create this kind of idea of a lock, okay? So you're getting this kind of effect here. All right, so this idea, something like this. It can be, um, you know, if we had to take a stab in the dark, Brian does double punch. You know, in Cypher, you do double punch like this. So Brian does double punch. One, two down level. One, two, or three. We move to the block. Move to the next movement. Hand going out this way. He takes a hook. One, block with this hand, strike with this hand. There are a couple of simple ideas for you explaining this movement, okay? Or giving you an idea. I don't want to say it's an explanation. Just now I stand on this very senior sensei's toes. So we here. One, two, three, four. So you could use any bunkai for mawashiuke. If you choose Jordan, Chudan, locking bunkai, great. I lock him up once, he fights, I clear his hands out, I hit, he attacks block, and I strike. It's the most basic way to look at it. The reality is the starting point for me is problematic because in very, very few cases will you find yourself catching both arms in real combat. But in terms of hypothetical presentation, it's not a bad idea to streamline your very basic principles into this because there will come a time where you have the ability to grab onto an arm or you've got an arm because there's been a high attack and you've managed to grab and seize, you've cried, the person's trying to hit down and now you've got the opportunity for that. So this is not in its purest sense good self-defense anything. It's just to try and get an idea of how would you train this with a partner to build your interactive ability. So Brian, let's go. So I'm going to pretty much try and do what I've just said. So Brian is attacking Jordan. I'm going to go up and grab. He's now going to punch Chudan. I'm going to try and get to this lock. Similar to Sepai, he's going to fight against this. So I'm going to go with it and I'm going to twist my hands and strike. And hopefully push him away. All right, he's going to attack. When he attacks, I'm going to do Skuyuke. I'm not going to necessarily do it with the bottom hand, but... I'm going to do it according to if it's a left or a right hand, and I'm going to move to the outside. I'm going to choose the most appropriate hand. And so Brian steps in. One, two. I would never do Nukite this way. So I would do uh, Uruzuk. So this is the way I would build something. So let's try that again. Let's go on the other side. So that hand attacks first. One, two. He punches. Down. I try to get to this lock. He fights back against it. Instead of going around the head like Sepai, I'm now going to scoop his hands. I did. So, uh, out the way, push him away, he attacks, 
This time I'm on the inside. Now Nukite is an option because I can strike for the groin. This or this, I'm going to break my fingers. I would use Uruzuk again. All right, so it's a very, very basic, basic idea on what to do. We can get to a point where maybe we make it a little bit different. So Brian punches, uh, punch two down, one. So I do one, two. It's a part of my, my washiuke technique. Now I'm hitting him or attacking from this side. He now attacks with the other hand, two. Yeah. He's either doing a straight punch or step and throw haymaker. So step across. And now I've got his arms in this beautiful locking position. One. Okay. I might use that squee, okay, to grab the groin, close the distance, and attack the ribs. All right. So this is... Most people forget this can think of a tiger's paw coming up and attack the groin, grab, pull, hit. So very, very simple idea. So I've got two ideas that takes us to here, and this is repeated four times. Hey Brian, we finished the fourth time. We have three times a very smooth cat stance mawashi. Okay. Now Washi okay and cat stance, why would you combine the two? This is what you need to ask yourself. Is it because it's ex an essentially beautiful movement? Is it something that is just meant to be graceful and beautiful and show the absolute artistry? Or is there this underlying understanding of, of fighting and how do you use cat stance? So for us as a, a school or two schools or three schools, we often think of cat stance A as mobility. I'm moving, moving, and maybe moving. I'm just putting three together in a random order. Um, B, I'm drawing in, drawing in, pulling backwards and drawing in, similar to the movement in Kurumfa. All right? Or I'm absorbing to be able to lift up, like Seyunshin. The cut, and the cutter may look like this, but reality, I might, might attack upward. Or I'm being attacked from behind, and I am dropping and pressing my hip back and helping create that leverage. If I am getting this with this very, very angled cat stance, is it different from this where I try to keep my head above my hips? Is one good form and other one bad? Or are there maybe different bunkai being shown? This is what you have to figure out for yourself. But I essentially believe that that is the case because there are some schools where cat stance tends to be buttocks sitting, body pitching forward or body pitching forward. Other schools, very neat, very tidy. You know, like beautiful upright posture. Somebody in a private post suggested that it might be a throwback to the statues of the Buddha, very straight, erect in the Moashuke. I don't like putting a religious twist on anything because it kind of alienates a whole bunch of people. But if that is the case, then so be it. I'm not going to indulge it. I'm more interested in the martial value because essentially that is the reason people do karate with me doesn't matter if they are Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Hindi, atheist, I don't, that's not, my, that's not my department. Okay, my department is to make it that they can use it. With that in mind, I think what we've got to look at is this idea of pulling downward. Okay, so maybe some bunkai here, let's go Brian, will be along the lines of if Brian is attacking my hand, and I'm pulling him down to attack and to attack. Let's go from that side. I'm going to show you what I did. It's kind of like the idea in uh, Seyunjun, you know, where you do this and say, they say you trap the hand and you press down, but I'm going to do it that way and then try and lever him past using the koke. Then hit 
hit. Okay, so let's go on the other side so I can see. I'm levering it past. Hit, hit. So there's idea of my mawashuke that comes into play. If I am pulling backwards, so if he grabs on, pulling backwards, there's no way of reaching him. Just step in. If I wanted to do it the same side again, please, Brian. If I wanted to use the step to attack or to attack, life becomes a little bit more interesting. One, two, three. All right, so there's another way of viewing this. It may be, you know, you do one, two, and then all of a sudden you shift like down a diagonal. It may be that he grabs on, shift down the diagonal. Now this front foot automatically becomes a kick. And once I've kicked, push him away. Okay, so some basic ideas tweet based on trying to combine the principles of why do I stand in cat stance and I'm not just obsessing with the hand movements. After that we pivot, turn, double punch, shift forward. Some schools do a get on barai and a punch, some schools do a tetsui and punch, some schools go one, two and they leave out the idea of pushing. So we've got a couple of ideas. So once I once I turn, there's the blocking, double punch, press forward, your arms do not move, there's a concept there to consider, then kind of like pushing and holding and then hitting over the top. All right, so the idea now is what do I use these different techniques for? How do I use them to my advantage? So a basic principle for us to work on, similar to Geeks at Edge, my partner punches. I move inside, hit. He push him, he hits again, block, hit. Very, very simple. Come this way a little bit, Brian. There we go. Let's do it again from this side. So one, I know you can't see right now. I press him, he punches. Okay, so this is one idea. One, two, press. Okay, I'm going to use this to my advantage. Block, press, hit. So here's another idea for you to play with. Hey. Okay, so that brings us to the fold up blocks on the 45 degrees. And again, different schools do it differently. So in some schools, you will find the extensive use of both hands being uh, one knuckle fist, uh, sometimes pressing thumb. I think this is boshiken, keikuken, boshiken. All right. Sometimes one hand here, sometimes hand here. Some schools, chudanuke flat, hikite. Uh, you just do what your school says to start off with. The core parts are there is a block, there is some kind of punch through the gap, and there is a strike. Hidden in amongst that, you may find in some schools that they do opening and closing. I'm just doing a different hand for the sake of it. Opening and closing. Some schools, This hand grabs on. All right, so these are some of the ideas that are held within that combination set. And then obviously there's four different directions, so you can play different angles against your opponent so that you can figure out what works best for you. So, Brian, let's go. So I'm going to start off with uh, right leg back. Kamai, he punches. I move in, hit. That simple. Block, hit, then step in and strike. All right, so we're going to do left side. So I move to the inside. One, two, I'm going to move in and strike. But not what this hand does. This hand does this as I do this. Sorry, microphone. One. 
Okay, so that's the reason for this. Now, it works a little differently on the outside. So let's go right side. So Brian attacks one, 45 degrees. Okay, now I want to hit through. I don't have to, his ribs are right there. I hit through and I step in. And again, that blocking hand is immediately here to strike and I'm here, all right? This obviously affords me the options of trying to just lever him down onto the ground. So it's a very basic idea. Let's go to the right side, please, Brian, it's better for the camera. One over the top through this gap, okay? So I'm trapping and holding and I'm moving through this gap here. Kind of looks like Seyunchen at this point, you know? One, two, I'm going in here, grabbing and striking. So if you take your ideas from Seyunchen when you do this movement, it's a very similar idea but you're just adding in a punch instead of a tetsui. In our case, we often do this, and we do a, a palm strike to the side of the head, what we call a clop in South Africa, or AAK, attitude adjustment clop, all right? For the other South Africans, a PK, all right? And there's a joke in South Africa that means you hit the person from a town called Tolekwane all the way to another little town called Kakamas. All right, a little bit of South African humor for you. But striking and going into your opponent. Blocking and hitting. Holding the guard up as you do it. We tend to hold the guard up in a few places. So, for instance, Sesan holds the guard up. And later on, Suprumpa, we're going to hold the guard up again, where we have defense and simultaneous strike um, as we move. And we now finish all of this. We get to something that's considered a little bit awkward by some people is one, because this hand doesn't move. And then two, three. So get on, chew down, chew down, kick, elbow, uraken, and either a breakout or a strike or a push away. So let's have a look at how we do this. One, we could have very, very classical, he attacks me three times and I defend. So he does a maigiri and a double face punch. So as he does maigiri, I will block with one hand and I'm gonna try to get out of the way a little bit. So as he kicks one, I'm gonna go one, he punches, two, three. Now, something simpler. Okay, we do it again. And we worked out very nicely because the moment Brian punched, because I was standing stationary, I was able to deflect and move his technique slightly, but this is stagnant. For all intents and purposes, it doesn't make good self-defense training, but it does just give you the concept, okay? So let's go right leg again. As he kicks, I might move, block and grab, block, grab. So now I've already got part of this entrapment here. Kick for the groin, the knee, the hip. Whatever takes your fancy, all right? Land that little elbow, those ribs. How's it feel, Brian? So, what, two, this is the idea here. We get to this, and then punch with this hand one more time. Jordan. Ah, oh, you're wherever. This hand, and strike. All right, let's go to the other side, okay? So, I move a little bit to get out the way, wide. I block across, two, kick or kick or kick, whichever one takes my fancy, round, the one that most people don't see, in, up, okay, and then from there, something's available, but because this hand is already in this plane, as Brian attacks, go Brian, I've already got it out the way, so that hand pulling, drawing, dragging or trapping, and then striking the ribs. Okay? One, two, three. Up to there. One. Uh, see, sortion. You don't even have to go any further than that. They kick, you block, you smack them in the face. It's that simple. They attack low, you hit down. They grab, you block, strike. Okay? The three easy bunkai. Take them directly from the katasi sortion. So my Gary, 
as he attacks one, two. Block low, hits high. Maybe a chew down zuki or a get down zuki. Again, moving in and hard and strong. He grabs on, block, and strike. So these are three very basic, basic ideas that you can use in that place. All right, we then get to one, two. One, two, I'll do it another way. One, two, I'm gonna go backwards. One, two, different way. One, different way, so the same way. I've done this one already. But again, it just depends on what school you come from, which one you're gonna do, and what you're hoping to achieve. There are, there are five of these. Okay, and again, it's this mass repetition of superumpe. Simple ideas, my partner attacks low, he punches low, I block, and he punches high, block and grab. Okay, that's one idea. The other idea, he, let's go, let's do, see if we can go to the outside. He kicks my giri, block, he punches, trap, grab, and now I'm on part of the outside, but I've got this angle to work within. All right, now attacking, attacking, attacking. Um, I like this idea if you hear uh, more like kurumfa or sepai, you step in, one, two, because you now kind of broken his frame, his structure, his strength. Okay, so very, very easy. Yes, you can gouge the eyes, grab the throat, pull the collarbone. A whole bunch of things that poor Brian is grateful I'm not going to demonstrate. We get to the end, we do a turn, open hand block. I don't know if you want to call this like an inverted sword hand block, but it's a chidan uke. Open hand block, crescent kick, turn. My Toby Gary, and now we consider okay, why open hand? Whenever your hands are open, why? What is the main reason? So Brian comes. Uh, let's go left side, attack please. Two down, one. One, I've blocked. My hands are open. Can push. Okay, that's one idea. Can grab. That's another important idea. So sometimes it's this. Sometimes let's go right side, punch one. One, two. All right, I do this. Brian, what are you going to do? So, create an opening. All right, so the idea of what do I do? Where does it come from? Where can I use it? How can I tweak it or make it optimal? All right, and again, now I'm using... Very typical goju double action blocking. I don't need much more than the one hand to block his straightforward punch, right? So he does one, I go one, he does a second one. Block two, three, and then I'm moving on with the kata somewhere else. Oh, one, two, and we're aiming for low kicking, all right? Oh. Okay, that big crescent kick. Oh yeah, okay. So sorry, keep it simple. Please punch one, one. Clear his hand, he punches two, three, four. And you get a couple more ideas. <laughs> All right, one, two. Oh yeah, some schools do an extra break here. Some schools just go here and then out. We've covered this movement already. Simultaneous block strike. All right, so that side punch, please, Brian. I don't need to do anything more than that. I think it explains itself. Sanseru, he grabs my hand. One, two. All right, you know, a number of ideas. You can grab on. That one's quite cool. Over, there's the kouke, there's the other kouke pressing down, you know, it goes inside, but 
press down, help create this and then a beautiful strike up to the groin. Hey, so some ideas to cut a super rumpe or pichurin and hopefully I haven't upset too many high grade senior sensei who consider this very much their domain. These are ideas just to help you understand the cutter so that you can do a better cutter. I think the uh, concept should be if you have an understanding of what it is for and you're not just mimicking and copying movement, it starts to become something a little bit more tangible. The next thing is, unless you are learning this cutter as a little child, it should not be available to people who are absolute juniors. I deviate in opinion here from Sensei Chinen, who was my teacher for a long time. He used to teach this off the gigs at an E, and he insisted all of his students knew it. And in his, many times I heard him say, this is Gekside I son. This is the third Gekside. It's the development. It's like Gekside H, Gekside an E, super umbre. It's got everything. He had a very good, important, logical uh, piece that he based that judgment on. And that was that Many instructors only learn this towards the end of their career. The gatekeeping process or the glass ceilings on cutters are held in place. And so students never have the physiological capability to do the cutter adequately. They haven't developed fully, especially students who are not training with the same kind of regime that is used in Okinawa. And so you get to your 50s and 60s at the same age as the Okinawan sensei is maybe getting into the kata, and all of a sudden, uh, you're not able to do nearly as much as them. And that is because of their approach to karate in a day-by-day -day setting. Um, I've noticed when I've been in Okinawa that the same people are consistently in the dojo and the training time, open dojo, not class structures, open dojo, between two and three hours. And if you're in the dojo over a um, quieter period in the year, let's say December, January, you find everybody's there five, six days a week. And you just do the math, in three hours, six times a week, 18 hours, the average person, that's one week. The average person only does eight hours of karate outside of Japan in a month. The average person. There is no ways you can compete with the physiological development and the improvement in the body. So with this in mind, since Echinen used to teach Super Impi a lot earlier because people were younger, more agile, more, more supple, and able to do the cutter. I do think that if you are going to be using this as a competitive cutter, it is a good idea to give some basic ideas of application for your children so that they're not just dancing. The greatest sadness for me is to see an eight-year-old doing a very beautiful Super Impi. It's aesthetically beautiful. Um, they don't know what they're doing. And shortly after that, they give up karate because they know it all because they've learned the most advanced kata. There does need to be a certain amount of you get to learn this at the appropriate time. So if you're junior grade and you're watching this video and you're going, hell, that's such a cool kata, I'd love to learn it. Please bear in mind, this is the final kata on the list for nearly every Gorge Ryu Association. And it is somewhat sacrosanct. Knowing the kata and training the kata and training the ideas within the kata, when you work properly and you have an underlying understanding of all the kata up to Seisan first, will allow you to do Suprumpi a lot easier. That's the other reason I really didn't want to do Bunkai. I've done all the Bunkai before, because I've done Bunkai up to Seisan, which basically covers virtually all the Bunkai you've seen today. All that there is, is a connectivity between sun movements that some people aren't able to make. So for the people out there who wanted to see Super Rumpe, some ideas, some Bunkai, there you go. All right, don't ask for any more. Go to Okinawa, go train. Go to your sensei's dojo, go train. Go spend many hours training, training, training. And the rest will become apparent as you train. Hey, arigato gozaimasu. Don't forget to do what your sensei says. Like, subscribe, leave a comment. Sayonara.